historic travelers and welcome to a time greatly different from our own where we can learn about the top 10 things that were normal in ancient Rome, even though they may not be to us. Let's start with not consummating our marriage. In the Roman Republic, there was a custom saying that if the bride was a virgin, her husband should only sleep beside her or holding her without having intercourse for at least the first night of the marriage. The aim was to give the woman a chance to get used to the new situation, especially since marriage occurred young, and I cannot emphasize this enough, but women were raised to be very, very, very good mothers and housekeepers, but they were never actually raised to be lovers or partners. It's why so many societies in history we've seen a abundance of brothels and working girls, and a widespread acceptance of men seeking out infidelity. Their partners couldn't suit their needs because they didn't know how, but women without the job of being their wives could. Unfortunately, this very sweet just cuddle first night practice degenerated over time. Some men forced themselves on their wives. The custom disappeared thanks to the male ego, and everybody agreed on the whole intercourse during the first wedding night thing. So a newfound tradition took root. Before the consummation, maybe a day or so before the wedding, or the day of a Roman woman would have to go through the process of deflowering. In order to do that, she was taken to the Mutinus Tutinus Temple on Vialia, where she would sit on the rod of Mutinius Tutinus, the marriage deity. Anyways, after sitting on it, she doesn't have to do anything more than that if she does not want to. The bride to be was successfully deflowered, and she was able to go have intercourse with her husband later. This strange custom supposedly derives from the Romans' belief that the first penetration being with the deity would guarantee fertility. And and healthy children. Next up is a poisonous cocktail. It was named after the maker of the poison, Mithridates the Great, whose father had been smoked by poisoned food at a banquet. Between that and the plots his mom and bro devised against him, Mithridates began a long process of gradually administering himself incrementally larger doses of all the poisons, toxins, and venoms he could find, in hopes of slowly building up his immunity against them. The blend was known as Mithridatium. Seeing as he lived into his 80s, homeboy may have been onto something and it seems that other Roman leaders agree with me with that. The story goes that assuming that he was now invulnerable to all threats, the young king became belligerent and power drunk and in 88 BC launched an ultimately flawed campaign against the entirety of the Roman Empire and it turned into a war that lasted 25 years. Mithridates eventually loses and flees to the Armenian countryside with one of his guards. Knowing that if the Romans found him alive, his kingdom would fall, Mithridates reportedly attempts to poison himself, but he's immune. Instead, he's forced to demand his his guard stab him to death. In an attempt to ensure that he could not be killed by poison, Mithridates had apparently guaranteed himself a bloody and violent death instead. Naturally, Roman emperors got a hold of this poison mix and followed suit in his path. But that's not all they're willing to consume. Next is Piss for Everything, where we see a porta potty, the Roman see dollar signs. In Rome, most of the citizenry's sewage ended up in the Cloaca Maxima, one of the world's earliest sewage systems. From here, urine was collected and thanks to its ammonia content was sold as a chemical used in laundry and tanning leather. Aside of Rome itself, full-ons, Roman dry cleaners, would visit the toilets and collect urine as well. Pause. How did they separate the urine from the feces? Was there certain toilets for certain ones and pipes that kept them separate? Or was it all one shoot and they strained out the solid matter? In which case that would be a lot more than just pee in that liquid. But let's not go down that rabbit hole that I don't want to think about. Urine became such a big business that Emperor Vaspinian, who ruled from 69 to 79 AD began taxing it. When his son Titus complained of the disgusting way his father was making coin, Vespinian told his son to smell a gold coin. Then he asked him if it stank. When his son replied that it didn't, the emperor replied, yet it comes from urine. Oh, call that dirty money you just got own, son. Even Emperor Nero passed a urine tax, which everyone had to pay if they want to use a public bathroom. So what else are they using it for? Mouthwash for whitening your teeth, growing juicy fruits like pomegranates and citrus, washing their togas, curing diseased animals, fertilizing lands, tanning leather, or their own skin. No shortage of piss potential in Rome. And speaking of bathrooms, the ancient Romans took explosive diarrhea to a whole new level with blowing up the bowl. Almost every city in ancient Rome had large public latrines, let alone any of average size or small size. In the Forum of Julius Caesar, for example, archaeologists discovered a latrine with 50 toilets. Like other latrines in ancient Rome, Caesars had heated floors. In general, many had marble paneling, mosaics on the floor, and even decorative statues. Yet when you enter a Roman toilet, this social and cultural hub of conversation and laughter and strained faces, there was a very real risk you would die. The first problem was creatures living in the sewage system, snakes, scorpions, octopuses, and clawing rats, which would claw up and just bite or 
and whack people on the ass while they did their business. Worse than that though, unlike today where we flush and walk away, they had to fear the methane buildup, which sometimes got so bad that it would ignite and explode under you. Sitting and doing your thing one moment turned to paste, obliterated against a stone wall the next. Toilets became so dangerous that people resorted to magic to stay alive, written spells meant to keep toilet demons at bay were found on the walls of bathrooms. Some though came pre-equipped with statues of Fortuna, the goddess of luck, to guard them. And many of these good luck charms were the Ficinius. Pant snake, elusive sausage, a Jimmy, a Peter, you get my point. These bad boys, big, small, uncut or cut, were seen everywhere. Hung in doorways, made into sun catchers or wind chimes, candles, jewelry, just about anywhere the Romans could slap a peewee, they did it, and they believed it to ward off evil spirits and the evil eye. Obviously they didn't share our modern skittishness towards the male member, let alone nudity. It was fairly common to see the everyday Roman man walk around with a copper dong on his necklace, seeing as they were believed to prevent harm from coming to people who wore them. Good luck peni were also drawn on safe places to keep travelers safe. Sharp curves and rickety bridges in Rome often had dongs drawn on them to grant good luck to every passerby. The volcanic eruption that buried Pompeii left it wonderfully preserved for archaeologists who when they got their first look at it, found things that were so obscene they hid them from the public view for over a hundred years. Pompeii was filled with art that was so filthy it was like a physicalized prehistoric Brazzers.com. To this day you can walk through Pompeii and see a site that Romans would have enjoyed every day. Dinglings carved into the road with the tips sometimes emitting a droplet pointing the way to the nearest brothel. In ancient Rome it wasn't your everyday Italian cuisine it was more like boiled bird and brains. When one thinks of Italian food we usually already aren't thinking correctly. Pizza was never made by them, the pasta most of us eat is it totally incorrectly made, and we're drinking cappuccino wrong. But you definitely wouldn't guess things like fried dormice or flamingo, peacock and nightingale tongues, lamb brain, sow's womb, and more. For flamingo and parrot in Fonio Cotero, a dish I can't pronounce, you would scald the flamingo, wash it and dress it, put it in a pot, add water, salt, dill, and a little vinegar to be parboiled. Finish cooking with a bunch of leeks and coriander and add some reduced must to give it color. No idea what that is. In the mortar, crush pepper, cumin, coriander, laser root, mint, rue, moisten with vinegar, add date, and the fond of braised bird, thicken, strain over, and cover the bird with the sauce and serve. Parrot is prepared in the same manner. Anything toddlers or grown North Americans would dislike from an animal was the favorite of the Romans. Many ancient Roman dishes are now famous in other countries, such as haggis, the national dish of Scotland, and foie gras, which the French have perfected. That's because the Roman Empire was vast, and when they conquered other countries, they brought snacks. Fun fact, if you had dinner and were an invited guest and brought along somebody who wasn't necessarily invited, this person was called a shadow or a parasite and would sit at your foot the whole meal. They were expected to bring witty banter and conversation to help compensate for their free meal. On the topic of weird eats, how about a celebrity diet? Gladiators, godly men of battle arena who were revered in the heat and ignored in the streets. But no matter how lowly the status, something about that battler's blood was desirable. Several Roman authors report people gathering the blood of dead gladiators and selling it as medicine. Strangely, some Roman physicians actually report that this treatment worked. They claim to have seen people who drank human blood recover from their epilepsy fits, and that was just the civilized approach. Others would pull out the gladiator's livers and eat them raw right there in the arena after he dropped. When gladiator combat was outlawed in 400 AD, people kept the treatment going by drinking the blood of decapitated prisoners. So while the gladiators who lost became medicine for epileptics, the winners became aphrodisiac. In Roman times, soap was hard to come by, so athletes cleaned themselves by covering their bodies in oil and scraping the dead skin cells off with a tool called stragil. I'll teach you more about that. Usually the dead skin cells were just discarded, but not if you're a gladiator. Their skin and sweat scrapings were often put in a bottle and sold. Often this was worked into facial creams that women would then rub all over themselves, hoping the dead skin cells of a gladiator would make them irresistible to men. And there's no way I wasn't going to talk about it on its own, scraping off the layers. The grooming habits of ancient Romans were strange mix of activities that we might recognize from our modern lives, and routines that are completely foreign to us. For example, this tool called a stragil, which resembles more of a horse his hoof pick than a human grooming tool was used by the Romans and the Greeks of ancient world to scrape sweat and dirt from the body. People who engaged in strenuous physical activity were prone to accumulating large amounts of sweat and dirt and were most likely to have this item in their possession. And it was most likely to be used to clean the skin before bathing so as to not muck up the water more than necessary. Some would lather up in olive oil to help the scraping process. If you're no gladiator that olive oil isn't going to be funneled back into a jar to sell. But 
rather for someone else to lather up in and use to scrape later. Ha, oh, public bathhouse luxury. Next up are the burial clubs, because death was an integral part of life for the Romans. Why not make a club, cult, whatever for this too, like they did for literally everything else. From the creation of Rome until about mid second century AD, cremation was the most common burial rite, after which the preferred method was actual ground burials. Shockingly, having your body baked was cheaper than a fancy box in the ground, so when cremation went out of style, Rome's poorest were often tossed into pits called puticuli, meaning to rot or decompose. These pits held a mixture of human remains, animal corpses, garbage, and excrement. Some of them were large, containing 24,000 corpses each, and they'd be left open until full enough. This wasn't the best way to be buried, so anyone who could afford it would join a burial club. A burial club was a group that charged monthly dues of 100 sequestries and a jar of wine for new members. And when one of the members died, you would all pool the club's money together to bury that member. Some of these clubs had mixed membership of serfs, unfreed, and freed people. If someone took their own life, however, it was considered a forfeit right to a funeral. In addition to burying any dead members, the other main activity of the club was to hold a series of feasts every other month to honor their dead. Some of the dues were used to fund those feasts, and each one, several members, were responsible for providing a certain minimum amount of food for the sad potluck. Imagine that. Thea, I know you're still mourning patricolis, but don't forget it's your week to bring in potluck figs and olive salad. Seriously. And of course, what completes a funeral more than a weirdly perfect replica of the dead person's face staring at you? It's death mask. The Romans celebrated the life and accomplishments of prominent men with marble busts, dedications of buildings, and grand tombs. One rather obscure crafted memorial overlooked because the artifacts have not withstood the test of time are Roman death masks, or as they're commonly referred to in Latin, imagines. Made of wax, they were unquestionably created when the man was in between 35 and 40, and that's when he had attained political office or ADL of city clerk. The new mask would join the older ones in the atrium cover where it would remain for display until that person's death. The date at which the masks were first introduced is difficult to determine, but they were already well established by the 2nd century BC, and they continued to be used into the 4th and perhaps as late as the 6th. The masks were then kept in the family throughout the generations, and and often displayed in the main halls of the house. At a funeral procession, the masks of the ancestors were worn by current family members as a way of preserving their memory. Polybius describes the funeral of an illustrious man and the role of his amigines. When any distinguished member of the family dies, they take the death mask to the funeral, putting them on men who seem to bear the closest resemblance to the original in stature and carriage. Penn Museum worked with four graduates to, and a career sculptor to recreate these masks, as you can see on screen. The group used only the tools and materials accessible to those in ancient Rome, and the mask came out really, really well. So quite literally, like the opening scene in the campy Paris 2004's House of Wax, the Romans were making wax faces. Thank you, thank you so much for viewing. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like and subscribe, as it'll keep you up to date with all of our cool video releases. Until next time.